in Matthew, as we've been studying the last week of the life of Christ, here in chapter 22, we have the account here of the Sadducees as they begin to challenge his authority as well and try to entrap him. And we'll look at that uh, summary of the story in a few moments. But read with me, if you will, verses 23 to 33 from Matthew. And then we're going to consider this passage from the account there in Luke. Matthew 22, verse 23 says, The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, If a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue or no seed, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, unto the seventh. And the last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, ye have not read, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and of God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we open your word, teach us through these different accounts, some of them seemingly just a hodgepodge of stories or accounts thrown together. But Lord, there is a sequence and there are truths in each one. And Lord, as, as they were applicable to those in that day, the truths are still eternal and they apply to us today. Apply your word as you see fit and according to each need of each heart. By your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn now to Luke, if you will. This is the same account as it is recorded by Luke. This, this particular account is recorded by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we'll refer to Mark here in a few moments as well. But in Luke chapter 20, I believe it's chapter 20, and verses, let's see here, verses 26 and following is where we find this account in the Gospel of Luke. And we'll be looking at that primarily today with some references to Matthew and to Mark. But as we understand this, this storyline, and we need to understand what's taking place. We're in the last week of the life of Christ. Sunday, he marches into Jerusalem and looks about the temple. Then he goes to Bethany. Monday he comes and he cleanses the temple. That means he cast out all of those that were trading and selling and money changing within the temple. And he cleansed the temple. And then on Tuesday he returns to the temple and the Sanhedrin had gotten together. Now the Sanhedrin is the, the Supreme Court of Israel basically. It's made up of Sadducees. It's made up of Pharisees. It's made up of uh, scribes and possibly I don't know if the, any of the Herodians were in there but now they're going to challenge him and we have seen the challenges and they said who gave you this authority and he said well you tell me something and I'll tell you that and he said you tell me the baptism of John is it of God or of men and of course they couldn't answer that because either way they would entrap themselves and show that he had authority from God and they did not so then after this, he told two parables of the two sons and of the husbandmen, exposing the hypocrisy and the wickedness of the Pharisees, the chief teachers of Israel. So in seeing this, and when they perceived that Jesus was speaking to them, they get together and take counsel. So they said, well, you know what, we're going to send some spies. One of the Gospels literally calls them spies. So they took of the Herodians, some that they would not recognize. And they sent them to Jesus to ask him the question about the taxes, remember? Is it lawful to pay taxes or not? 
And of course, they were the Herodians, they were loyal to the Herods who were loyal to Caesar. The Herods are not even Jews. They're Idumeans. And so they were trying to get him on, on something against Caesar, for or against. Either way, it would incriminate Jesus. And of course, he answered them perfectly. You give to God what is God's, you give to Caesar what is Caesar's. So then after that come the Sadducees. And we're going to look at the Sadducees here today. And we need to go back and remember, first of all, who were the Sadducees. But before we do, I want you to start putting together these different, these different messages. They are challenging his authority, and now they've decided he's got to die. To die, we have to have proof that we can convict him and then turn him over to the Romans to kill him. So in order to do this, we have to catch him in his words and in his teaching. So the Herodians tried it. The Pharisees have tried it. We've seen that throughout the Gospels. Now we're going to see the Sadducees try it. And next we're going to see the scribes try it. So pretty much all of those primary four groups of the religious leadership of Israel, they have now tried to entrap him in his words. And every time he answers perfectly. And after the scribe tries it, tries it in the next hour, they says from that point forward, nobody asked him any more questions. They said, we can't trip him up in his words. That goes to show the significance of the word of God, the significance of the words of Christ, and the power that they carry with them. He is the living word. So now here in, in Luke, and the reason I come to Luke is he gives some details of the, the account that Matthew and Mark do not give. And I wanted to look at it from this standpoint uh, if we may. So look here with me at the, at the passage here. And beginning there in verse 18, it says, Then came unto him the Sadducees. And that's a, the second thing. We looked at the story, but now let's look at the Sadducees for a moment. Who are the Sadducees? And why have we, we, we learned about them back in the first two or three lessons in this series. We're now on, on uh, message number 217 or 16. Do you remember who the Sadducees were? Now, basically, we, we summarized it this way, that they were, in a sense, if the Pharisees were the legalists, we would compare them to the hyper-fundamentalists of today, the legalistic, exaggerated, they added to the Word of God. The Sadducees, while they are liberal in the sense that they deny the resurrection, they deny the spirit, they deny the afterlife and all those things, they were liberal in that sense, but they were more dogmatic about the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses. In fact, to them, those are the only words of God. All the prophets in the Old Testament, all the ones that wrote about the first five books of the Bible, they are commentaries, basically. But they only have authority in the first five books. And so because they claim Moses does not speak of any resurrection, then there is no resurrection. And if the prophets talk about it, and Moses didn't, then they're wrong. So all that we find out in the Old Testament about resurrection, they have thrown out. They say there is no resurrection. In fact, in the book of Acts, chapter 23, verse 8, it describes they don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in the spirit. They don't believe in the afterlife. So what, what do we do? So thus far, we have not seen them interfere much with the ministry of Jesus. Why? Because they really don't care. He's teaching about the resurrection of the dead, and they don't care about the resurrection of the dead because they don't believe in it. So they're about their business. Now, who were they? They were part of the, the more affluent uh, group in Israel. In fact, the high priests came out of the sect of the Sadducees. They were part of the group who were in charge of the concessions and the merchants there in the temple. So they received income from all that was transpiring in the temple. So they're part of that upper echelon. They were very few in number, but by compensation, their power in the high priests, their power in the Sanhedrin, their power in the temple balanced it out compared to the Pharisees, which were much more in number, but they were commoners. They were of lower stature as far as the social ladder is concerned. And so the, the Pharisees and scribes, they always kind of held together. 
The Pharisees had added so many things to the word of God that it was hard, and they emphasized those and not the scriptures themselves. So that's who they were. The Sadducees, they were over here making money because they don't believe in the afterlife, which means what you have in this life is all there is, and once this is over, that's it. So why follow a Jesus who's talking about preparing a way to go to heaven? Who's talking about resurrection if there is no resurrection? So stop and think about this. This is who they are. But why now in this last week of his life are they all of a sudden all up in arms about this Jesus and trying to join the Sanhedrin and their Pharisees, which are their rivals in Israel, their arch rivals? They debated amongst themselves about the resurrection. In fact, it's interesting, when they debated themselves, one of the things that the Sadducees and their superiority liked to do, they would, whenever they got into discussions, the Sadducees would simply say to the Pharisees and scribes, well, where in the books of Moses did he ever speak about the resurrection of the dead? And it stumped them. They'd have to go back and study the first five books, and they came up with three basic verses that they would look at, if you look in uh, Numbers 18.28, Numbers 18.28, in the description of the offerings that were to be brought to the Lord, Numbers chapter 18 and verse 28. And they would often refer to this verse, Numbers 18 and 28 says, And thus shall ye offer an heave offering unto the Lord of all your tithes, which ye receive of the children of Israel, and ye shall give therefore the Lord's heave offering to whom? Aaron the priest. Now Aaron's been dead for a long time. One of his descendants is now the priest, which is what this means, because he was the, the first of the high priest, and of his sons would come the other high priest throughout the, the, his, the future history of Israel. So they said, see there, he said, give it to Aaron three. So Aaron's alive. Now that's not what that verse was trying to teach. But that's, that's, what, that's one of the ones. And of course that wouldn't work. And then they go to Deuteronomy chapter 31. And this one was kind of amusing. Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 16. It was, they would read it this way. It says, and the Lord said unto Moses, behold, thou... Thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up. See there, there's resurrection. But they didn't read the rest of the verse. And go a-whoring after the gods of strangers in the land. That does not teach resurrection either. And then chapter 32 and uh, verse 19 was a third attempt they gave, which was, And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of the sons and of the daughters. That does not sound like the right verse, 32, but that's what I've written down. But anyway, these were three of the ones that they used, and that third one's probably a mis, misprint as far as the uh, text itself. But they used texts that they were grasping at straws to try to prove there was the resurrection, and so they would fall flat in front of the Sadducees, and the Sadducees would say, see there? Ha ha, you don't know there is no resurrection. And by saying that, it cancels out much of what the prophets wrote. It canceled out all of what Jesus preached. And later, after Jesus, after the church begins, they persecuted the apostles, even in the book of Acts, because they denied the resurrection. One time, Paul was being challenged by them. They're in Acts 23. And in the debate, he finally talks about the resurrection of the dead. So then the Sadducees and Pharisees started arguing amongst themselves about the resurrection of the dead. And it kind of canceled out the whole argument right there. So the Sadducees don't believe in resurrection. If there's no resurrection, why did Jesus come? If there's no resurrection, how then do we preach that he was raised from the grave? And as Paul says, if there's no resurrection, we are of all men the most miserable. So what do we do here? These Sadducees have now asked Jesus. They've joined with the Pharisees, the Herodians, and now the Sadducees, and later we'll see the scribes in their challenge of his authority and trying to entrap him, testing him. So he says, Master. Now, obviously, if you don't believe he's a real teacher because he teaches the resurrection 
and he's done these things that you're challenging, you obviously don't see him as a teacher, didaskalos, master. So this is a, a, a sarcastic uh, use of the word here. They don't mean to show that respect. They're simply, it's like, okay, teacher, tell us this then, if you will. Moses wrote it to us. Notice how they grabbed a hold of Moses. Not the scriptures, which most Jews saw that as Genesis through Malachi. They saw only the first five books. So they said, Moses told us this. If any man's brother die having a wife, and he die without children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now this is, he's, they're quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 through 10. This is talking about the Leveret Law. The Leveret Law. Why, why the Leveret Law? Uh, because the distribution of the inheritance of the land that God promised Israel was to be preserved at all costs. In other words, even if you had, because you're in hard times or you're indebted to someone, if you gave, sold your land to them, on the year of Jubilee, that land came back to its rightful heir. Because the land was to be preserved among the families as it had been divided by Moses and then Joshua and as instructed by the Lord. And so if a man did not have a son, he didn't have an heir because the, the daughter's inheritance came through their husbands. So the son, if, if you had no son, you had no heir. And then what do you do with the land that he had inherited? It doesn't pass on and it's not preserved. So you take, if, the, if he dies, then a single brother of his would then be, by law, he would marry his wife, and those children would be considered heirs to the dead man, the dead brother. And so they would preserve that inheritance. And this was, this was very well known to the Jews, and, it, and there in Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10. Now they're going to give... We saw the Sadducees. We see where they see their authority. But now I want you to look at the stupidity. The stupidity. They give a scenario. Now look at this. There were therefore seven brethren. And the first took a wife and died without children. And the second took her to wife and he died, died childless. And the third took her in like manner and the seven also. Now, I don't know about you, but I believe if I was that fourth or fifth one, I'd have been somewhere else by the time it came, my brother died. Because something's going on with this lady that they're all dying one after the other, and they, none of them had children. But last of all, she died. It says there in the end of verse 31, and uh, verse 32, last of all, the woman died also. So this is kind of a, a far-fetched scenario. That she would have had all seven brothers as husbands. They all died and she died childless so there would be no heir. Now this scenario, remember the Sadducees don't believe in resurrection. They're trying to entrap Jesus. And so what do they say? Verse 33. Therefore, in the resurrection that you preach, whose wife of them is she? For all seven had her to wife. You, have you ever seen those arrogant people come up and say something and then they use that, this dumb thing that's come up? If, you, if you've ever been a sound technician and took care of microphones and know how sensitive they are, you don't drop microphones. But they'll say something that they think, okay, we're done. They just drop the microphone on the floor like that. And that's sort of the impact here of what they did. Master, teacher, imagine this. And it says, okay, so... Whose wife is she in the resurrection? Ha ha. And they kind of drop the mic. They think they had him. They think they had cornered him to where he has no answer. And they thought they had proved him. And imagine all the Pharisees and scribes as they're listening to this. They catch their breath. Okay. We've never been able to answer this. We've never been able to prove to them from the books of Moses that there is a resurrection, says, how in the world will Jesus answer this? So they're caught between. They want Jesus to answer it properly, but yet at the same time, they want Jesus to be caught. To contradict Moses, contradicting Moses, would, he would lose face before the children of Israel. They would not see him as a prophet. Therefore, they could lay hands on him. They could kill him. 
You see, the whole, all these plans are to lay hands on him, to arrest him, and kill him. That's what all these different last few chapters have been about. So, now look at the scriptures. And Jesus answering said unto them, there's, there's several things we want to find out from what he tells them. First of all, look at their lack of knowledge. To do that, we need to drop back to the book of Mark. And I'll read it for you here. Mark chapter 12, verse 24. And Jesus answering said unto them, Ye do err. And the word err there is, you're wandering off. You, you are, it's like a sheep that is wandering off. Or you have gone astray. You don't, you don't even know what you're talking about anymore. So this, this is a great affront, a great offense to them. But it was a put down in the sense he was putting them in their place because they needed it. Because of two reasons. Number one, you don't know the scriptures. Now these that were absolute literalists about the first five books and you could not deviate any way, shape, or form from those five books. They rejected that anything that contradicted them in the rest of the Old Testament, would, they stood only with these first five books. He says, you Sadducees don't know the scriptures. You don't know Moses, and you don't know Moses' writings. And secondly, he says, and you don't know the power of God. Now those were the, Matthew points this out, and Mark points this out. So before the statement of him beginning to answer them about marriage... He tells them, you don't know the scriptures and you don't know God. You have wandered off the reservation, folks. So that tells us where the Sadducees were and what their condition was. But he answers their question. And to that, I imagine the Pharisees and scribes said, hallelujah. Even though he was their enemy, they were trying to kill him. He says, at least now we have an answer to give to these Sadducees that have been putting us down for years because we can't give them an answer. So what is the answer? Back in Luke chapter 20 and verse 34. And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage. But they which are accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die any more. For they are equal unto the angels that are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. Now that's packed. So let's, let's break it apart. The children of this world, the word there is ion, this, this age. They are married, that's the men, and are given in marriage, that's the women. The men and women, they marry. Why? They marry because they are mortal, because they die. They sin in the Garden of Eden, and they will die because of that sin. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you have to understand, we marry and are given in marriage in this world, in this age. Why? Because if not, the population on earth will become extinct because all will die within a certain period of time. And so they were to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. But it said, when we get to that life, it's not going to be so. So first of all, you need to understand that you, because you are sinners, you are going to die. And after the death will come, will come the judgment, as we learn later on in Scripture. Of course, Christ has been talking about that too. But then verse 35, the word but, that conjunction, turns it around. Okay, the children of this age, they die, therefore there has to be marriage, and there has to be procreation. But... They which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world. Okay, what does that mean? That world is talking about life after death. The, the world that comes from the resurrection. We would call it, this is heaven for the believer. It is hell for the unbeliever. But it, hell is death. It's the second death. Revelation chapter 21 verse 8 tells us that. But God has given eternal life to those that will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And those who are accounted worthy, what does that mean? They in themselves have merits to get in? No. Because there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that are good, Romans 3 tells us. So the only way to be accounted worthy is by some measure that God has predetermined that we must come up to that standard and that standard he revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
We have to place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and be clothed in his righteousness in order to be accounted worthy of that world of eternal life. So first of all, what we see here from the scriptures, is, and the Lord Jesus is educating them who thought they knew more than he did, says you die in this world because you're sinners. You must procreate. That's why, that's why we are married. But in the next world, those who are, first of all, you have to be accounted worthy to get in there. And that is only through Christ. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. It's that simple. But also notice this. And the resurrection from the dead. To be accounted worthy of the resurrection also requires that we be saved. Now, there will be a resurrection of the unsaved and the unjust, and that will be there at the great white throne judgment. They'll be raised for judgment and then cast into the lake of fire. But the resurrection unto life that we're talking about here, life after death, is just this. And those who are worthy to obtain that, wor that world and obtain that resurrection, they do not marry. They neither marry and the women are not given in marriage. Why? Because in that world, no one dies. So this is something else we know about salvation. We have everlasting life. Verse 36, neither can they die. You can't die after the resurrection. Imagine that. God is life, and he gives us everlasting life. And therefore, those who have come to Christ, they cannot die anymore. Have you thought about that? We don't have to worry about disease. We don't have to worry about accidents. We don't have to worry about someone breaking in and killing us. We can't die. Now this world, I, you know, the more we strain and, and struggle to stay alive in this world, and I understand why we do, it's part of the human nature. And, and the fear of death, even among believers, it is still there, humanly speaking. The old nature is afraid to die, but yet the new nature longs to go and be with him. And they struggle with within themselves. But it would do us well in our lives and in the lives of others to always keep in perspective these verses of what awaits us. Well, notice this. They're equal unto the angels. Angels don't die. Angels don't marry. They're not given to marry. They cannot procreate. Why? Because they don't die. There's a set number, and we believe about a third of those fell. And two-thirds were confirmed in a righteous state. And they don't have to procreate. They are not given. And Jesus here says, the children of this generation who come to know the Lord and they are counted worthy to go into that world and be part of the, called a child of the resurrection, being the children of resurrection there at the end of verse 36. They're like the angels. Now, it doesn't mean that we become angels. Okay? To do that would be a step down. Because in, in glory, we will be above the angels. Understand that. That's not the same relationship. Angels are ministering servants of the Lord. We are children of God. Heirs of Jesus Christ. Heirs, we join heirs with Christ. And we, therefore, will be above the angels at that point. I, say, I see so many of us. I, I saw on the back window of a car yesterday. I was sitting at the stoplight there near the railroad tracks near the rec center. And there was this memorial to their daughter in her teens that died last year. I imagine an accident or something tragic, around 19 years of age. <coughs> but they had her picture and they had angel wings and all this and some statement to that effect that she became an angel. And I think it's so sad. And I understand the meaning. I know it's not meant to be negative. But I don't think a believer should ever do that because you minimize what God has made you to be because the moment you step from this life into eternity, you're already a child of God before you ever died and you become a child of God, heir of God, joined heir with Christ. And to say that I become an angel is to lower us below what he has made us to be. So biblically speaking, we as believers should not aspire to become an angel. Okay? When someone passes, it's just don't do that. I know it's sentimental and all this, but it's not biblical. But when he says here we are equal to the angel, we are like the angel, it means in the sense that 
across the context is marriage and giving in marriage and the idea of raising up to them heirs. You don't do that in heaven because no one dies and there's no reason to procreate to maintain the race or to increase the race because that's not the way it's done there. So we understand that. This goes to our discussion on Wednesday nights about who were the sons of God there in Genesis 6 as we were discussing. But now look with me at verses 37 and following. And this, this really speaks to salvation. We see the scriptures, and in the scriptures we see the salvation. So we've looked at the story, the Sadducees, the stupidity, the scriptures, and now the salvation. Look at verse 37. Now, he said, okay, I've answered your silliness about whose wife she's going to be in the resurrection. If you knew the scriptures, you would have known better than this. But obviously you Sadducees don't know the scriptures. And said, so now let me quote to you from the scriptures. And since you only recognize Moses as your authority, I will quote to you from Moses and show you that the resurrection is real. Look at that first phrase. Now that the resurrection, that, that the dead are raised. So he's saying the fact that they're raised is obvious. They are raised. So you are wrong, Sadducees. And that pretty much throws their entire belief system upside down. They now have to reconsider their whole belief system. And by the way, folks, when you ever witness to a member of the cult or a member of other religions, this is what I believe it was uh, Francis Schaeffer referred to as taking the roof off of their house. He used that analogy because imagine you're sleeping in bed and all of a sudden somebody takes the roof off your house. You're exposed to the stars, to the elements, to the cold, to the heat, to the snow, to the rain. How secure do you feel when the roof is off your house? Not very secure at all. In fact, when we have to put a new roof on, we had to take the old one off, you just prayed there's no rain before you can get some type of weather protection back down. Anyone that's done construction, or if you've been under that, you know how important that is. One downpour could cause tens of thousands of dollars of damage to a home. In our belief system, when someone takes that off, it's when you expose the error of the security that they held on to. But he talked about this. He said, if you take the roof off of their belief system, you have to give them something to put back on. He said, to take it off and leave them there, you won the argument. You have done cruelty to that person. You can't just go in and debate someone about their faith and prove they're wrong and walk away. You then introduce them to the right security in the Lord Jesus Christ. You give them the proper roof to put back on top of that belief system. And it's a very good analogy. So the Lord Jesus has already, by showing their fallacy there, he, he's shown that they just don't understand the scriptures. But now he's going to literally remove the roof off their belief system. He says, that the dead are raised. Even Moses showed it. And he's referring to that passage back in Exodus 3, 6, where he, from the bush, God said this. I am the God of Abraham the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He quoted from Moses, their great authority. The most revered prophet of all of Israel to this day is Moses. Abraham, yes, he's the father, but Moses is that revered prophet. King David is the most revered king, but above all these is always Moses. Because he was the one God talked to face to face as a friend. He's the one that God chose to reveal his law and his standard to. And so to this day, even today, Moses is revered among Judaism. So as relates to that, he's going to quote Moses since they, he rejects anything from Joshua on down to Malachi. So he quotes Exodus 3, 6 and says, Didn't God through the bush speak to Moses? And said, I am, I am, present tense, the God of Abraham who's been dead for 600 years. I'm the God of Isaac who's been dead for hundreds of years. I'm the God of Jacob who has been dead for over 400 years. How can he say, I am the God of someone who's already dead if there's no resurrection? Because once they're dead, they're not living. And notice the next verse. For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. 
Our God is not the God of the dead. Our God is the God of the living. And when we step from this life into eternity, now in the Old Testament, the Old Testament saints, they would go to sleep, go to their fathers, go to a place called Sheol or Hades. That was, it was two-sided. One for those who had believed the Lord, and they're there until they are called to, at the second coming. They're raised. And that's where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be raised. To God, God said, they're not dead. They're, part, they're children of the resurrection. Now the other side was like the rich man in the parable. They're in torment until the time they are raised to the great white throne judgment and then cast from there to the lake of fire. And so that's, that's the description. So you have the two sides of Hades there and the division that is there. But what he said, you, you Sadducees think that these men have been dead for all these years and all these prophets have been dead and they're just, it's soul sleep as one, one cult puts it. No. They are alive. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. For he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And all live unto him. Now think about that. We've known many people who know the Lord who've gone on to glory. And he is still, he's their God. Nevermore have they enjoyed life more than they are now because they're enjoying everlasting life. They don't have the limitations and the struggles and the fears and all the things that we deal with in the flesh down here. They are children of the resurrection because they were accounted worthy because they trusted Christ as their Savior. And that's where they are. And basically he's telling the Sadducees, you are not children of the resurrection. You're not accounted worthy of that world because you are rejecting the very Messiah that God sent to preach the resurrection unto you. Seven brothers, one wife. You missed the whole point. And that's the foolishness of men. When they keep coming, trying to come and try, you come not for the purpose of preserving truth, but you come seeking a means by which to entrap and to destroy someone. Now we see that going on in our world today. We make up our minds about someone and then we try something to confirm what's already in our minds, rather than observing the truth that is there. It's nothing new. Cults do it. False religions do it. Secular world does it. Political world, obviously, as we're seeing in our day and age right now. They do it. I want you to look finally at verses 39, at verse 39 and 40. 40 really applies to after what we'll see in the next hour because Luke does not cover that event. Matthew and Mark do. But notice that the certain of the scribes answering said, Master, thou hast well said. Now this certain of the scribes, we know from Luke that it is a scribe, and over in Matthew, they were together with the Pharisees, but the scribe is the one who asked that question for the next hour about the greatest commandment. But here in this passage, it says, Master, you've said it right. The scribes and Pharisees, they're thinking, Phew, Lord, finally, we have the answer on how to answer the Pharisees, I mean, the Sadducees. Thank you for that. The Sadducees had nothing more to say. They, they were speechless. But the Pharisees only agreed because it gave them ammunition against the Sadducees, and they missed the whole point of the entire message. Are you a child of the resurrection? Have you been counted worthy, not because of your works, not because of who you are, not because of what you've done, but because you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you have made him your Lord and Savior? That is the only way to be accounted worthy of that world, to be a child of the resurrection. Now, I'm going to tell you this. There are many, and we're, we're in a day and age where you think, you have your truth, I have my truth. The truth is divisible. We'll, we'll just spread it out. You can make up whatever truth you want to have, and we all must tolerate, we all must acknowledge everybody's truth. And the absurdity of that has come today in the gender issues and all these people identifying as animals or as different genders and all this nonsense. Truth is truth. You ask a medical doctor when he examines someone, he can tell very quickly if it's a man or a woman. And he must treat them differently based on what their creation was, not what their identity is. 
Truth is truth whether you believe it or not. Death is real whether you believe it or not. And pay close attention here. Eternity after death is real whether we believe it or not. And the Bible tells us the one who is eternal, the one who made himself flesh and revealed the Father to us. He said this, there are two destinies. There's everlasting life and everlasting punishment. And those are the only two choices. Whether you believe them or not, they're going to transpire. And the question here is, instead of being so caught up with trying to prove somebody right or prove somebody wrong or justify ourselves. We need to at some point humble ourselves before God, acknowledge we're sinners, and acknowledge we can't save ourselves, and acknowledge that God in his love sent his son to die on Calvary for our sins, and therefore providing the one and only way to be accounted worthy of the resurrection and of that world. And the question today is, have I received that? Have I trusted in him? Let's pray. Father, we pray this morning that this seemingly far out, ridiculous story, being caught in one of the most monumental weeks of all human history, and sometimes we read over it and not quite fully understand the entire meaning of it, but Lord, as we look at it in the overall context of what was happening that week and the purpose of the Pharisees, the Herodians, the Sadducees, and as we will see, the scribes in the next hour, of trying to entrap and destroy the very Savior that could save them from their sins, that can make them to be accounted worthy of the resurrection and of that world that awaits those that will trust him. Lord, anyone hearing this message, I pray that if they have not yet been accounted worthy, you'd convict that heart and, Lord, that they would humble themselves before you and through Christ become a child of the resurrection. Apply your word now to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.